Believe it or not, competitive gaming has existed for more than three decades. Starting from basements, to arcade rooms, to land with PCs lined up one after the other, to small venues with stages, to bigger venues, to arenas, and now to the forefront of mainstream attention. Esports. The esports. The esports world. The world seems to be moving at a quicker pace than ever. And for esports, it's been no different. We've had our good times, and we've had our rough times. And what's certain is that we're going through a period of change, with new players at the table. With so much going on behind the scenes, as well as center stage, it's easy to start wondering, where on earth is esports heading as an industry? That's what I'm here to help explore. You've probably heard this a bunch from your old history professors trying to make you pay attention during class, but what they said stands true. To gain a full grasp of what is happening and what is going to happen, you've got to pay attention to its trends and its history. So let me be a history professor for a topic you actually care about. There are a few moments in the competitive gaming history that could be considered as revolutionary for esports as a whole. Amongst the first pivotal moments in the history of esports was probably the Red Annihilation Quake Tournament in 1997, where over 2,000 participants competed online with the finals held at the E3 Expo in Atlanta. What made this moment so special wasn't just the sheer interest the event gathered at the time, but its prize. A Ferrari owned by Quake's co-creator. A prize as luxurious as this was unseen previously in gaming competitions, thus instating it as the first big step towards legitimizing the space. The tournament's winner Thresh is now considered by many the first pro gamer ever. The event was a testament that esports didn't just belong in arcade rooms and basements. And in the early 2000s, that thought gave birth to two companies, which would fuel the space with gaming tournaments for years to come. Major League Gaming and Electronic Sports League. Technological advancements in broadband connectivity, as well as HDTV, helped these companies run quality broadcasts, slowly aiding in the professionalization of the industry. The next big revolutionary moment was in 2011, and it was none other than the launch of Twitch. This gaming streaming platform was the perfect environment for fostering an esports scene and quickly became the hub for competitive gaming and tournament broadcasts. The platform grew exponentially fast and with it, so did the esports scene, already reaching over 43 million viewers by 2013. The rampant growth esports saw in popularity gave excuse to bigger, better, flashier tournaments to take place. In 2013, the League of Legends World Championship was held in the Los Angeles Staples Center. And I accentuate, sold out in under an hour. Oh, and it attracted over 32 million online viewers, by the way. The sheer scale of the event, the leveled up production, the prize pool, it set a new standard for future tournaments. And the global reach, that encouraged more sponsors and investors' attention than ever before. That moment made the annual Worlds tournaments an unignorable highlight for the yearly esports calendar, and somehow kept managing to one-up itself for the next few years to come. With the incredible Imagine Dragons making the event anthem for the following year, Warriors, and one year after that, made an augmented reality dragon fly through the freaking stadium. If you asked any fan in the 2010s which esport had the biggest of prize pools, they'd know it was Dota. In 2019, Dota 2's International's prize pool really raised the bar, surpassing a whopping $34 million, which, by the way, was funded primarily through in-game purchases by the community. This historical moment showed how deep the support from the gaming community towards esports really is and prove that esports was undisputably financially viable. It would be a travesty if I don't mention Counter-Strike's contributions to the growth of the esports scene. After all, the esports scene of the Counter-Strike global offensive game is what really made esports cool altogether during those times, and where some of the biggest esports personalities were created. You are not my friends, you're my brothers, my friends. The game's recurring tournaments like ESL One Cologne, Intel Extreme Masters, as well as the Majors, are some of the most thrilling esports events to date, creating the best 
stadium atmospheres. These events would essentially turn the host cities into Counter-Strike enjoying hubs, and the crowds every time, whether local or traveling, would pump up the arena with passion fuel chants that would rival the European football scene. Counter-Strike was community-driven from the beginning, where the developer only came in to help fund the largest events of the year. Pair that with the game's simplicity and the high skill ceiling, it fostered a thriving competitive scene, which still today is only growing. This brings us to 2020. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the need for online entertainment reached unprecedented heights. Many of us were locked indoors and had a lot of time to spend on playing our favorite video games, but also following our favorite esports. Sure, eSport events had to transition to online formats, but they could still run. The industry had a level of flexibility other entertainment forms couldn't compete with, which ultimately led to instant rampant growth. The growth reached heights in record time, and given that eSports is essentially a hype-fueled machine, it was stupidly easy to get carried away and throw bags and bags and bags of money at companies in the space whether that was for advertising, partnerships, or even basic investments. But all of a sudden, that record-breaking growth came to a halt. Post-COVID, when the world returned into its default state, the competitive gaming industry found itself in an overinflated state, where targets could no longer be possibly reached and investments came to a very sudden halt. Just like so many tech companies, at the start of this year, the gaming industry was hit by layoffs of terrible magnitude. Thousands and thousands of workers across companies like Riot Games, Activision Blizzard, Xbox, Discord had suddenly lost their jobs, creating gaping holes all across the industry. This is not only scared off the workforce, considering jump and ship, given that this could be just a giant bubble starting to pop, but it's also scared off long-term investments. Many reluctant on handing over big lamps of cash for projects that don't really have some tangible quick economic gains. Honestly though, the overinflation of the esports industry was inevitable. The writing was already on the wall. The collapse of the Overwatch League was already hinting that something like this could occur soon industry-wide. The OWL's hyper-ambitious franchising model to try and run an NFL or NBA-like tournament on a global scale, with city-based teams competing year-round with home and away games, was completely detached from reality. Sure, it sounded mega exciting, and many, such as my naive younger self, thought that this could be the future of esports. At the start, everyone in the Billionaires Club seemed like they wanted ownership of a team in the Overwatch League, paying up to $35 million for a piece of that pie. But quite frankly, the plan was delusional, and there was no way this model was economically sustainable. And once the investors realized they were never gonna be making their money back, one by one, they decided to cut their losses and say bye-bye. Ambitious, risk-heavy, or even careless projects like this were not uncommon during the late 2010s. But as cash became more scarce, the questionable moves would eventually backfire. COVID just accelerated the process, bringing us to today. If you follow the space, chances are you've noticed things aren't moving as fast as they once did. We got very used to seeing each and every event one-upping itself, both in prestige and scale. Money simply isn't shoved at the expense of epicness like it once did. Which, for us fans, is quite frankly a little bit of a letdown. But, I assure you, completely necessary. The industry is working towards being a sustainable place. It just took one major blow after another, and now it just needs to see to its wounds before it can get up and running again. While the competitive gaming industry is at its weakest, some found the opportunity to provide a helping hand. At a moment where companies need cash the most, Saudi Arabia, with their heaps of oil money, has overnight become a major player in the industry. The amount of acquisitions, partnerships, and hiring of industry-leading workforce made by the governmental bodies is mind-boggling. Amongst the biggest are ESL and Face It, now becoming the EFG Group, which is not only in charge of large sectors of multiple esports circuits, such as Counter-Strike and what remains of Overwatch, 
but also run the newly introduced and so-called Esports World Cup. The event aims to be a yearly occurrence, creating a stage for all the big esports teams to compete on all the popular esports titles. Now this looks exciting, grand, epic, new, but personally, this still feels like a band-aid solution to the industry's problems. This is just repeating trends of the past. It's just shoving cash into this space without thinking about the consequences of what happens when the cash flow dries up. Now, I want to make this clear. This is not a geopolitics video, nor is it a video judging the people, the companies, and the workers who have taken these handouts. As someone who works in the industry, I know that if you feel your head's underwater and someone reaches out, not much thought goes behind taking its grip, no matter whose hand that is. I am expressing, though, that the hopes for the full rebound of this industry lies elsewhere. I'm not going to lie, this is uh, a part of the script that I started going around in circles. Um, this shit isn't simple, and I'm definitely not the genius that can solve all the issues of the industry. But I do know this. Although we often take examples of traditional sports to compare esports to, there is one big fundamental difference. No one owns football, like no one owns basketball. But games like Valorant, Dota, Rocket League, Rainbow Six Siege, all of them have their game developers who have complete control and ownership over the IP of their product. Sure, sports have the federations which run the biggest tournaments, but if those federations fail, they can be replaced. But when it comes to games, teams, tournament organizers, players, they all rely on the developer. And if a game's developer messes up, its eSport is in jeopardy. However, as history has shown us, the eSports industry is built on passion and community. Developers need to know that even though it's their job to not fuck their game up, their eSport will only grow with the love of the community. It will grow when the people harness that game as their own, not when they feel like they're a cog in the money-making machine of the developer. It's the knowledge that the everyday gamers time and financial contributions are aiding and supporting the hardworking players and professionals, the people behind the events that help provide entertainment and thrilling moments that will be savored for years to come. Sure, different developers have different approaches to how they manage the esports scene of their games, whether that's Valve's relatively hands-off approach with Dota or Counter-Strike, or Riot Games' all-controlling system with League of Legends and Valorant, whatever the approach, the community needs to be at the forefront of decision making. The game may be the body, the developer may be the mind, but the heart and soul of every esports scene is its community. The people make the difference, and as long as the gaming community cares, which you cannot deny it does, esports will grow and prosper.